Hi everybody, welcome back. In this video, we will investigate the effect of temperature on reaction rate. Up until this point in previous videos, we've discussed the reaction rate, we've determined the rate law, which is understanding how a concentration of the reactants can affect the rate of reaction. And in the previous video, we looked at the integrated rate law, which is understanding the concentration of reactants as a function of time on the rate of reaction. And I've alluded to the fact that temperature plays a role. I've said that the rate constant is the same as long as you're working um, under the same temperature conditions. Um, so temperature, as you would suspect, plays a big role, and we're gonna discuss that right now. So, the temperature dependence of the reaction rate is actually contained within the, re the rate constant, little k, which is only constant, as I've said before, when the temperature is constant. So temperature dependence of the reaction rate is contained in the rate constant and that's little k which is only constant when temperature is constant. So we're going to look at the Arrhenius equation, which is going to show us the relationship between the rate constant and temperature, and we're going to learn about the activation energy. So the Arrhenius equation is little k is equal to a e to the negative E A over R T. Now, what do all these variables stand for? Well, E A is the activation energy. Or also called the activation barrier. And its units is usually in joules per mole or kilojoules per mole. And you can see it right here. So it's the energy required here to get over this little hill. Okay, and we'll discuss it in a little bit more detail in a second. R is the gas constant, and you use 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And remember the reason why we use this one over the 0 0.08201 uh, liters atmospheres moles Kelvin is because we're working with energy units, so you want the joules. Because R is in Kelvin, temperature also has to be in Kelvin. And A is referred to as the frequency factor. And that is defined as the number of times a reactant molecule approaches the activation barrier per unit time. So let me repeat that again. So A is the frequency factor. It's the number of times a reactant molecule approaches the activation barrier per unit time. So in this figure here, we're showing you an energy diagram. And so you've seen these before when you discuss exothermic and endothermic reactions. Um, and so in this case, energy is on the y-axis. Reaction progress is on the x-axis. We always start with reactants on the left side of the diagram, and we always finish off with products. Now this is the energy diagram 
for hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas that creates water. And the number of peaks in energy diagram represents the number of steps in the mechanism, which I'll talk about in a future video. In this case, there's only one peak, and so that suggests it's a one-step mechanism. In addition, with every step, there's always associated this little mountain that you have to climb over, and that's referred to as the activation energy, or also known as the activation barrier. Um, and we'll discuss that in the next figure here. What that is, is that in order for a reactant to become a product, remember that bonds have to be broken and new bonds have to form. And so the top of the mountain, the top of the peak, is actually called the activated complex, or also known as the transition state. And we never can isolate the transition states. Transition states are only um, theorized, um, just very educated guess. Um, sometimes like computational chemistry um, can help us to elucidate what the transition state is, or just our knowledge of previous reactions and structure property relationships. And so you can see here that um, the reactant molecule had to rearrange and it's proposed that it, the transition state looks like this and then eventually once we get enough reactant molecules to kind of collide in the appropriate orientation we will then be able to make a product here. And because in this example here, the products are low in energy than reactants, then that means we would have a negative enthalpy of reaction, and this represents an exothermic reaction. But we need to have enough reactant molecules to get into this transition state orientation for the product to even form. All right, so also to, you see the activation energy starts with the energy of the reactants, and then how much energy is required to get to the top of um, where the transition state is located, okay? All right, so tying in temperature here and establishing a trend and a pattern, we see that from this figure, as temperature increases, the fraction of molecules with enough energy to surmount the activation energy barrier also increases. So in this example here, we have temperature 1, and we have temperature 2, and T2 is greater than T1, and this is the number of fraction of molecules with, with energy, and you can see here this is the activation energy. And as you would expect, as we increase the temperature, the area under the curve represents the number of molecules with enough energy to surpass or surmount the activation energy, and at T2, we have a greater number of molecules that surpassed it over T1. And so the trend we can state here is as the temperature increases, the fraction of molecules with enough energy to surmount the activation barrier also increases. So as the temperature increases, the fraction of molecules with enough energy to surmount the activation barrier also increases. All right, so now I want to talk about an Arrhenius plot. So I'm going to do a series of mathematical functions onto the equation um, in order to get an equation of a line. So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. and simplify it. I'm going to pull these apart. So anytime you're multiplied with the natural log, you can pull it apart and add it. 
And the natural log e of something is just basically going to be equal to what was up to the exponent there. So I'm going to simplify minus ea over rt. And then I'm going to write this equation in the form of a line, negative ea over r times 1 over t plus natural log of a. All right, so what do we have here? Well, like I said, we have an equation of a line. So y is equal to mx plus b. What am I going to plot for my y-axis? Excellent. You're going to plot natural log of k. Very good. What are you going to plot for your x-axis? Excellent. 1 over t. And what will your line look like in units of 1 over Kelvin? What will your line look like? Does it have a positive or a negative slope? Excellent. It has a negative slope because slope is the negative ea over r. So let's go ahead and draw that. look a little nicer. Okay. And so from there, we know the slope is equal to negative EA and the activation energy over R. And there you go. So if your data is limited and you only have initial and final conditions, then you'll want to use this equation. So natural log of k2 over k1 is equal to ea over r times 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. And this is the equation that our book is using, and so that's the reason why I'm, I'm writing this one down. A lot of times when students first see this, they're like, wait a second, there was a negative over here and it's a positive over here. But that's because these two variables, T2 and T1, were reversed, which um, changed the sign over here. Um, so you, if you look it up online, you may see the other form of this equation used, where you do see a negative and then the T2 minus T1. But this is the one that's used in my class and in the textbook that we're utilizing. Okay. And if you are in my class, don't worry, I would provide these equations for you. You just need to know how to use them correctly. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's practice. So this question is asking us to use an Arrhenius plot to determine the activation barrier in kilojoules per mole and the frequency factor in inverse seconds for the reaction below. Um, so if you were doing this particular problem in my class, you wouldn't necessarily have the graph provided for you. Um, if we were, for example, working a homework problem or a work session type problem. Um, for an assessment, I would have to provide the graph like I'm showing here um, or the equation of the line. So just be prepared um, to be able to use a graph or to use an equation of a line to extract out data based on your knowledge of the Arrhenius equation. However, if you're doing a homework problem or a work session type problem, I challenge you to create the plot in Excel or Google Spreadsheets just so you get some good practice with graphing software. All right, so in this case here, the fact that it said Arrhenius plot for me indicates that I need that Arrhenius equation. And we have more than just initial and final conditions. So I'm not gonna use the two point equation. I'm going to use this one here. So the natural log of K is equal to negative EA over R times one over T plus the natural log of A. And that just reminds me that if I didn't have this graph here in front of me, that I know if I'm looking at the relationship between the rate constant and temperature, I'm thinking Arrhenius equation, and I would need to plot natural log of the rate constant, so I would have to convert these to natural log versus one over temperature in Kelvin. So I would just need to take one over these numbers since they're already in Kelvin. And I've done that here. This is the natural log of K 
versus 1 over t. And as expected, we get a negative slope. Now, if you graph your data and you get a positive slope, check your work. <laughs> so always good to kind of cross check yourself there. Now, this question's asking us for the activation barrier or also known as activation energy. So we're really trying to figure out what this number is here. And remember that the slope of the line is equal to negative EA over R, which in this case, the slope is negative 10283 as shown here. And so if we want to figure out what the activation energy is, then that's going to be a negative, negative 10283 times 8.314 is equal to 85492 joules per mole. And I'm going to just round this to three significant figures. Usually this is given in and it's asking as well in kilojoules per mole because activation energy is pretty large numbers that we're working with here. And so remember that there are a thousand joules in one kilojoule. And so I just divided this number by a thousand to get 85.5 kilojoules per mole. All right, this one's also asking for the frequency factor. And remember the frequency factor is A and that comes from the y-intercept here. And so the y-intercept, I'm gonna use a different color. So y-intercept, is equal to the natural log of A. And we see that right here. So natural log of A is the y-intercept, and that's this number here, 29.967. And anytime you wanna get rid of natural log, you do E to that on both sides. So that gets rid of that. So A is equal to 1.03 times 10 to the 13th inverse seconds. And you want to get big numbers for the frequency factor because remember what it means. It means the number of times the molecules approach that activation barrier. There's a lot of molecules you're working with in solution, right? And so this number is going to be really big. And the units for frequency factor are always per unit time. And so in this case, um, our rate constant was in inverse seconds. And our frequency factor will also be in inverse seconds um, as well here. All right. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.